Welcome to another Unwinding with Fiber and Fabric. It's quiet in the house at the moment, and so I thought this would be a good time to put together a short video update on what I'm doing and what I've been doing since the end of Tour de Fleece. But before I get into that, let me give a shout out to all of my wonderful subscribers. I have been just tickled. As I've said in other videos, I started doing this as a way to share with my family and friends my crafting and um, and and fabric, love of fabric, the joy I get from fabric and fibers and spinning. And when I decided to do this, I thought, well, rather than piece by piece just trying to get the information out to my friends one by one, why don't I put the videos together and and share it with whoever is interested. And I have to say, I'm so excited because during Tour de Fleece, I finally reached over a hundred subscribers and the number keeps growing slow and steady and that's fine. I, I'm excited. I'm excited when I see that another person has, has found joy in my, um, my crazy little videos. So, I wanted to say thank you to all of the people who have made this summer and the, this, this whole past year, but especially these last few weeks, these last few months, such a rewarding experience because it can get a little crazy and I do love all that I'm doing, but it just tickles me. It just gives me so much more a warm, joyful feeling when I get a comment, somebody hits like, and somebody subscribes because it means that what I've done has touched someone's life. And for me, it's not about the numbers. It's about that little piece of something I've done has touched someone's life. And that is just truly the greatest joy to know that, <laughs> that in my crazy little world, I've reached somebody in a way that, that they might've saw useful or special. So thank you. Thank you all for just watching. <laughs> so back to my updates. So Tour de Fleece ended now, oh goodness, weeks ago. <laughs> and when Tour de Fleece ended, I knew we would be only a few short days and we'd be into the Summer Olympics. And for those of you who follow the social media crafting site Ravelry, you may be aware that Ravelry has been doing a uh, Ravelenix for quite a number of years. And it's just a fun way to get crafters to challenge themselves, to share what they are creating in a way that supports them, them in the community of crafting. And we do it alongside the um, Winter and the Summer Olympics. Has no affiliation with the Olympics, but crafters tend to like watching the Olympics and things like the Olympics, like Tour de Fleece, while they're crafting. We sit in front of the TV and we crochet and we knit and we spin and we quilt and we do these kind of things. And so it's really wonderful to have this opportunity to share and be feel like we're part of the community. And this year has been especially wonderful because anyone who's following the Olympics and following fiber arts knows that we have, um, we have an Olympian out there who knits while he sits in between waiting for next competitions. And I just think that's wonderful. I think it is so wonderful to see this. Um, and I, and I say this and grin inside every time I say this, this young man, I'm reminding myself now every day, it seems, or I should say somebody's reminding me of this every day that I'm finally old enough that I can look at someone and say, yes, they're a young man, <laughs> even when they're not in their teens or their twenties. So I've been enjoying watching the coverage. I've been enjoying watching, um, just the, the joy, the, um, surprise, the excitement, the wonderful display of athletics. And I have especially loved the response to seeing knitting now on the Olympic stage, legitimately on the Olympic stage, not as an event, but as what most of us understand these crafts do to us as a way to relax, as a way to keep our minds focused and um, 
keep the stress at bay while we wait in between things, while we get through our days, whatever our tasks are, whatever our jobs are. These fiber arts, these textiles, um, textile arts, they help us. They help us find joy. They help us find relaxation and they help us find peace. So shout out to all of you Olympians <laughs> who have discovered the joy and stress relief of knitting and crochet and, and these textiles. Kudos. You are impressive on many fronts. So back to the um, update as to what I'm doing and also the topic that I wanted to share, which is dyed in the wool. It is a phrase that many people may have heard of, but they may not always know the meaning. And I recommend anyone who has not heard of it or anyone that's not really sure what it means, Google it because it's amazing how some of these terminologies, well, they come from textiles. They come from, they come from wool. <laughs> and as you learn, if you study certain his, um, history, you see that, that wovens, the wool industry really changed the world. It's, it's part of what created the Renaissance. The, the first industrial revolutions really came from new technology going from the spindles to the wheel and how all of a sudden it made the production of fabric so much faster, so much more economical. And, and so we get a lot of phrases that come from the weaving, the wool production into cloth world. And so it's always fun when you find one and you look it up, but I'll let you Google it to get the actual definitions and I will tell you what I know it means. Dyed in the wool as opposed to dyed in the grease or spun in the grease. Dyed in the grease and spun in the grease means that you are putting the dye into a very lanolin filled wool. It will take some dye but it won't take it as well because that lanolin which is actually a waxy substance that lanolin would prevent it from really getting to the wool. I've played around a little bit with it. It's kind of a waste of dye in my, my um, est estimation. But dyed in the wool, on the other hand, oh my, I've been, I've been playing with dyed in the wool fibers um, right from the beginning of my spinning experience because I love the kind of non-solid color that you get. It reads as a solid from a distance but it's not solid. It has variation of color. And not only does it make it easier to um, not have light and dark patches that you don't want, it highlights the light and dark patches. And so when you do this in the raw wool, not the, not the lanolin raw wool, but the scoured raw state, the locks, you get wonderful colors. And I will show some pictures as I'm speaking of the different, um, some of the different things. But the first thing I want to show you is what does it look like to see dyed in the wool? And the first that I'm going to show you, this is, I, I'm going to show some Lester Long wool because that's what I've been spinning a lot towards the end of the Tour de Fleece. And I've got a couple projects that I've been working on that I was using it. So it was the bucket of fiber that was in the house when I was playing the other day. And I needed to dye um, some some silk um, fabric, and I was like, "Oh, that's pretty dye." And, Ooh, there's some excess dye <laughs> that I made because it's you know, I only needed this little bit of silk, and I made too much dye. So what can I grab to use up the dye? Well, I grabbed Lester Long Wool, and this is a gray Lester Long Wool, and I over dyed it this beautiful teal. And if you look at it, you'll see. The dye soaks in to areas. And you can see this is this is just the locks kind of all mushed up because I've I gathered it up to put in a bowl. This is just the locks and it cut takes the color in different intensities. And sometimes that's due to the fact that this this is wool that has some light areas, some dark areas, but it's also because as it hits the wool, if the wool has a little bit of lanolin left in it, it's not going to take the dye as intensely as an area that was more 
fully scoured. So you just get different levels of color. I also did some that was a darker um, section. So this this blue, it, it, it's, it's the same gray that I'm about to show you, but it, it kind of lightens up the fiber. This is the same fleece, but now it's in this caramely coppery color. And there we go. There we go, center of the screen. And you can see the lighter patches there we go the lighter patches of wool like this I am going the wrong direction sorry um, the lighter patches of wool like this okay it really took on the orange darker patches took on different colors now the other thing with this I forgot this one <laughs> this is fiber that I had some leftover of the orange so I put the fiber down in a mason jar and then I sprinkled, oh yes, now I'm remembering how I did it that day. So I had left over the orange. Orange has a tendency when I make it, the, it, it has a lot of color, it bleeds a lot more. So I had this orange, I put it with the fiber and said, oh, that's not enough color. So I sprinkled some dark blue, or I should say, I sprinkled the teal over it and I got this. Well, it soaked up a great deal of the dye, but there was dye left over. And so that's why I grabbed more and I went with this. So I was dyeing silk. I did have leftover. The leftover was the orange. <laughs> and it's been a crazy time. I, I, you know, it's like if it was three days ago, it was in the past. And this was now well over a week ago. So I had the orange and I used it, but it didn't look like it was going to cover the fleece enough. So what did I do? I sprinkled some just dry powder right onto the wet fiber, put it, you know, put the, the, the mason jar in the microwave, microwaved it for a bit, and it looks beautiful. I can't wait to spin it. However, there was a lot of leftover, now teal, so I had to have some teal. So what am I going to do with this? Don't have any idea whatsoever, but that's dyed in the wool as opposed to if you already spun the wool into yarn and then dyed the yarn. Simple as that. So, it's not the only wool I've been dyeing and I am going to show a picture here of one of the projects that I did for Ravelenix. I dyed some wool and I spun some more. Again, some more of the same Lester Long wool that I just showed you in lock form. And I <laughs> dyed nine ounces of Lester long wool and I spun it into this big, big, gigantic, that's my crochet hook, big, gigantic, big, gigantic ball to make some, a, an amagram. So <laughs> look at, whoop, pull back just a little, look at the different color variations. And I know that the camera isn't pulling it up quite as orange as it looks here in my hand. Um, it's, it's when I'm, when I'm crocheting it, I'm just, just amazed with all the different colors. So I will make sure to put some good pictures to show some, some of it with a little different lighting so you can see, but it is just a beautiful russet and I keep going back and forth. What kind of critter am I going to make? I think it's going to be a bunny rabbit because I haven't done a bunny rabbit yet, but I have. You guys, if you've been watching my videos, will remember Mr. Strange Cat, my little alpaca cat. Al the alpaca cat. But look who I made. I made a bear. <laughs> so this is the fiber that I spun. This is the CVM fiber that I spun during Tour de Fleece. And I crocheted him up just the other day. <laughs> and I just love him. He, they, they're both from a book that I've talked about. There we go. Um, Edwards Menagerie. This is by um, Carrie Lord, and you can find it. It looks like um, you might be able to find some of her patterns on Ravelry. They do have them listed, but I have the book. I, I I love it. I love all the different little critters. I love the fact that their bodies and their arms and legs, for the most part, are all the same. Are there? The, the, although there's some color variations um, and technique, and then their heads are a little bit different, and their ears are different, and and their adorable little tails are different. So, 
that's what I've been working on. I finished this little bear. This little bear. And now I believe it's going to be a bunny. There's enough wool here. There's enough yarn here. I should have no problem making a bunny with bunny ears. I had thought about doing a sheep and trying the sheep, um, the, the technique to make the fluffy um, wool around the body. But I think I'm just going to go with the, the bunny rabbit for now and um, use this. And, and this, this is fiber. I, I was just amazed. This is, um, this is a Lester long wool. It is just a simple three ply, but it crochets up. It, it just, it, it crochets up so much more, um, I don't know, compact and shiny. There's luster on it. And so just seeing the difference, this is a four ply, just seeing the difference. I mean, they're, the bodies are the same. Oops, hold on. Sorry about this. I'm trying to do this in front of the camera. The bodies are the same dimensions. I'm almost done. I've only got a couple more. So because this, oops, sorry. This is a, this guy is a four ply and this guy is a three ply but it's a, a thick wool. They're not, there's not that much difference in the bodies. So I just find it very interesting how when crocheting up the fibers, this is a loftier fiber and this is a denser fiber. So maybe when I crochet, the loft gets squished out, whereas this one didn't have any loft to begin with. And so it stays the same, but same, the, they're the same bodies, but they're kind of, you know, you know, the, the wool is different. So again, I've just been having fun playing with, um, these guys because crocheting, um, and following a pattern, as I've said before, that's something that I just, have, um, I only learned not, uh, not many years back because I lose count. And I was just used to crochet and make things, um, off the fly. And, and so it's, I just am finding it really fun to do this and, and it's simple enough that I don't get lost and I can keep track. And all of the things I do in my recliner when I'm watching TV need to be fairly simple because um, usually by the time I sit down um, to knit or crochet, my brain's fairly tired and keeping track of things is a little harder. So I get lost. So I love these patterns because I don't get lost. But also speaking of Lester Longwool, um, I did spin some more of this, um, it comes from a ram, um, called, um, Gunter. And I, you, I spun up a bunch of it so that my daughter could ply a single with this yarn that she spun. So those of you that have been following the video, you may have watched my video on, um, using a hackle to blend fibers, uh, now a few months back. This is the fiber that I was going to use in Torta Fleece before I decided to only use un, uh, uh, unprepared, unprocessed fiber. So I gave this fiber to my daughter to spin. She spun it up and rather than plying it upon itself, she plied it with a Lester long wool single and it worked really, really well. So people who, um, there's, I know a lot of people who like to spin up a soft, fluffy yarn, maybe a thick and thin, um, and they want to ply it with a thread. What we did here was made in essence, a thread out of the Lester long wool, because it, as I've shown in, in, um, other videos in a short that I did these long wools, I would imagine any of the long wools, Lincoln long wool, any of them, these long wools, while they don't necessarily, because they're, it's a coarser wool, you're never going to get the fine, fine, thin threads that you would get for some of the lace stuff, but you can get pretty thin singles. And so I challenge you to try instead of just going and getting a, a, a purchased thread, why don't you get some, why don't you get some long wools? and spin them fine and try plying them with your character yarns. This, oh, it's still so soft. 
this is definitely something that is um, still true to the purpose that I, I blended it. It could still make socks. It uh, could still make slippers. It could still make mittens. Probably even a hat for somebody who doesn't have hypersensitive skin like I do. It's just, it is really lovely. It's, and it's, and it's still, it's got lovely drape, lovely texture. And so I recommend when you're, if you're, if you're thinking, well, I want to do some character yarn, um, and I want to apply it with thread instead of getting thread, get yourself some long wool. Because when we purchase fleeces that are not necessarily next to skin soft, but we can still use, we're supporting the, the, the shepherds who, you know, who are raising this. We're supporting the industry. We're give, we're in essence, helping keep it going. So that's my tip. I have used thread. I'm not saying that you can't use thread. But try, as a spinner, to maybe come up with your own thread. And this is a really great single to add to this. I think we may actually maybe knit this up or weave this up and see what happens when it felts, just as a curiosity. Who knows? But it has to be a little less crazy than it is at the moment before we're going to get to that. Because, um, yeah, it's been crazy. And it's summer and hopefully I will get onto, I have the quilt back here that I'm still quilting on. I have the quilt here that I'm doing the quilting on. I have a baby quilt that I, <laughs> that I have ready to do the final piecing of the blocks together before I can piece the blocks into the top. <sighs> it's been crazy. I did want to show, I had one more thing I forgot that was sitting here because I was resting my leg against it and forgot. What does it look like when you use dyed in the wool yarn? Well, you're seeing some dyed in the wool yarn being crocheted like that, and you're seeing it there. Okay. Dyed in the wool. This is dyed in the wool yarn. And so is this. And this red go over here. There we go. Now I'm in front of the camera and the pillow is in front of the camera. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, I'm tired. I need to wrap this up. Um, it's at least on my screen that I'm seeing, it's looking a little orangey, but this is a white and black fleece that was over dyed with black cherry Kool-Aid. <laughs> Doesn't smell like Kool-Aid anymore, but it did for a long time. And that, it's just that, that color. And that's how beautiful it's, it's in, in person. It's just dark cherry red. Um, I have no idea what I got, what, what I did. It might be pink lemonade for all I know, but you can see, if I bring it up close, you can see the pink is obviously uh, over dyed on something that was a little bit white and gray ish or tan. This has dark areas and light areas. This has dark areas and light areas. And when I crochet, this is just a big granny square, crochet the two of them together. And what's inside is a pillow that I have uh, made with a burgundy fabric so that, you know, you can have the holes. So, I think I may have shown this once before, but this is an example of what happens when you dye in the wool and let the colors just blend as they will as you spin. You get some very interesting effects. You get some very interesting, um, very interesting, I dropped this guy over here, very interesting colors and textures and no need to change yarns when the yarn changes like this on its own. So it's a little something different. It's different than what you get if you over dye it. And in case anyone's interested, as I said, this is my little crochet hook. My husband makes the handles for me, he makes me these hooks because they're easier on my hand. And strangely enough, 
it actually works as a little massage tool if I'm just fidgeting with it. It's a great fidget toy. So, if anyone's curious, that's my little crochet hook. Well, I think I've covered everything that I wanted to talk about. I'm hoping to move into getting some of my quilting done um, and bringing some more uh, quilting videos. And, of course, as autumn arrives, I'm hoping to do some more machine embroidery. I had the machine embroidery um, uh, going the other day. I'm trying to remember what project I did now that I think about it. Um, oh yes, I didn't bring it. I have. I, I. I'll bet. I'll put a. I'll put a picture right here. I made a patch for my husband. I um, using a new um, module from the Embrilliant software. I took a design I did digitized 18 years ago, and I put it in a patch and I guess I'll, I'll end with this story so ab about 18 years ago my husband um, came home from um, from a military deployment and when he came home he said you know that sewing machine you're always talking about the one you call the grandma's machine he said would that machine make patches? Could you make patches with that machine? And I and I said, well, yeah, of course you could make patches with that machine. And the reason I called it my gra the grandma's machine is because I really figured I'd have to be a grandma before I could ever afford a machine that did that kind of work. Back then, um, well, and even now, well, the machines can be very expensive. But the difference that's happened over these last 20 years is that they're now machines of many different price ranges so it's a little bit as far as the machine goes a little more economical to get into machine embroidery than it was years ago but he asked he said so can this grandma machine that you're always talking about um, could it make patches and I said sure I said you know do you want to go and see what the machine can do actually see what the machine can do and and he's like sure so I think he'd been back from the Gulf uh, less than a week <laughs> and we load our you know our little kids in the car and we drive into drive the hour into town to take a look so I could show him up close and personal what this machine could do <laughs> we came home with that machine we came home with a full package of embroidery software we we had to actually talk to our bank because um, when we used the credit card, they're like, are you sure this is you? Because we, the only time we'd ever spent that kind of money ever before was on a vehicle. <laughs> Oops, sorry about that bump in the camera. On a vehicle and on our house. And so this was a very unusual purchase for us. It was leap and a prayer and hope that we could figure out how to make all the bills work. But we came home with some thread, some stabilizer, machine, um, the machine, and some embroidery software. And I sat down and spent 70 hours in the upcoming the week following learning how to digitize, how to use the software so that I could make my own designs <laughs> like a patch <laughs> because we were so poor. Um, buying designs was not something that was economical so it really did come down to could I learn how to digitize so I sat down and I did this in over 70 weeks in one week time over the next seven days with very few showers not eating a whole lot and my kids <laughs> wondering what in the world mom was doing I learned how to digitize and the first thing I digitized that I was you know that that I was ready to, to, to really stitch out and um, feel proud of is I digitized an f-16 um, fighter jet and I, uh, again, I'll show you some pictures. I figured out on the hoop, my largest hoop that I had at that time, that if I angled the design in a 45 degree from corner to corner, I could make a much larger um, embroidery than my hoop was set up to do. And, um, and I did that and I made it for a jacket that my husband had at the time. And over the years my son wore it um, quite a bit and it's 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 quite it's quite um, it's quite a fond memory but I did try my hand at making patches um, 
And then I completely moved into digitizing other things. And the years passed, and I used the machine quite a bit for the for other things. I used it a lot for maybe making baby receiving blankets um, for friends, for family, for charity. And then for a while, when my health kind of got a little rough, I didn't didn't do as much of that kind of stuff because I had other things that were um, that I w was focusing on. But a few years ago, I got back into using the machine all the time. I got back into digitizing just a couple years ago when I found the Embrilliant software, which is for me just leaps and bounds beyond what the other softwares that I've been using um, allowed me to do because I like being able to create it myself rather than having wizards and stuff like that. But I have to, 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 to put out there that yes, and Brilliance recently came up with a way to make the patches look like the spec, um, the specialized patch machines. And I was intrigued because I remembered my husband asking all those years ago, could you make patches? And so I was intrigued, but I hadn't played around. And then they came up with this whole module that makes patches all over the place. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, that's going to be cool. <laughs> but I was like, well, but I'm, I don't really have a use for the patches like I used to. And I was scrolling through it because you just can't help but at least look. <laughs> And I saw this one patch that they had set up that was a pre-made patch that you could then use and it's, oh, it's all interactive and it's all wonderful. It's not wizards anymore. It's, it's just, it's interactive and wonderful. And I saw this patch and it looked exactly, the shape of it looked exactly like the patches that my husband's unit had always used, the shape. And I thought, oh my goodness, that's the patch. That's the basis. I could put I could put the cougar that I design, design, digitized all those years ago on it. And I broke down after talking to, to my, my kids about it, to talk to my husband about it. And I finally realized that emotionally I, <laughs> I had to, had to go down this route. And so, so I put this patch together and the thing that I wanted to, in addition to the story, what I wanted to share about this is I took the design that I digitized 18 years ago that is technically thread art, not just embroidery stitches of a flat nature. Thread art, something I had forgotten I had even attempted to do. Something that I have been playing with more um, in this last couple years. But I took that and as I stitched it out, oh, I was sitting there going, oh my goodness, I would so do it this way differently and I'd so change this. And then I said, but oh my goodness, look what I was doing 18 years ago when I didn't have YouTube videos to teach me. Um, I didn't have all of this, the, 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 the access that I do today. And so I have to, I had to pat myself on the back. It made me feel really good. Life has a lot of things that can be road bumps and the world can have a lot of fearful and worrisome things going on all the time. It can be overwhelming. And, um, as something I read, um, in a social group the other day said, uh, somebody was talking about it and they said, I feel like my body is rebelling against me. And so when you live in a world we have today, and you feel like sometimes your body is rebelling against you and maybe it's because of illness or just age or just stress. When you're in this world and it can be a little overwhelming and it can feel a little dark, doing something like <laughs> a teddy bear for yourself. It doesn't have to be for someone else and it doesn't have to be for self. These are mine. I stuffed them with wool scraps as in the leftovers. I wouldn't want to give these to kids. They have safety eyes. They're, I've done everything I can make them safe, but they smell like the Irish spring soap that I use to keep moths at bay. These are filled with the waste fiber, including the, the grasses and weeds that I pick out. So these are mine. These are made for me. These are made for my joy. They're made for, 
for me to have joy today. And, and they've given that to me. I like taking pictures of them. And I feel just like when I was a little kid. I mean, I love, <laughs> I love stuffed animals. I love the joy of making them. I love the joy of sharing them. And they don't, they don't have to be for anything else than for joy. And something tells me that my kids are going to steal them. My grandkids are going to, somebody's going to come along and steal them and they'll be fine. They'll be fine. And they do smell good. I would never use Irish Spring Soap as a soap, but I would definitely use Irish Spring Soap to keep away the moths, and it smells great when it's been sitting with the fiber and has made the fiber smell it, because it's really, really strong soap. So I share this with you because I patted myself on the back, remembering what I had uh, tackled 18 years ago. Over that 18 years, I went from believing I was healthy and strong and could do anything to finding out that my body was rebelling against me in so many different ways. But I do think that the reason I never gave up, that I never lost hope, that I keep going on, I make these videos, I share the joy, is that when we create, when we create something, when we try, that joy, it makes up the difference. It helps put a salve to the wounds. It combats the stress. It pushes away the dark clouds and brings out the sunshine. So that's my message. I guess the video wasn't quite as short as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful day. I hope you can get out some fiber or some fabric and get creating. I hope that you've had an opportunity to enjoy some of the Olympics, connect maybe in a way to one of the athletes, regardless of your physical situation, your emotional situation. I hope you found an example of the challenge succeeding, the joy, the camaraderie, the community that the Olympics has always represented, that the knitting groups and the quilting groups and the crochet groups and the weaving groups that they represent. I hope you're staying safe. I hope you're wearing masks. I hope you're getting the vaccine. And most importantly, I hope you're finding a way to stay connected. Thank you for those of you who've watched my videos and watched this to the end. I wish you a wonderful, happy unwinding with fiber and fabric, and we will see you again soon.